I tried one meeting outside and the wind blew and nobody could hear me. Uh, maybe if I get a microphone like Mary has, I'd be all right. <laughs> Hey, how's the grandma? Oh my gosh, I'm, <laughs> I'm walking on clouds. I'm so excited. I bet. Everybody so doing okay? Everyone's doing great. Baby's gaining some weight. And actually, we're um, they're going to come to our house on Thursday. They said if we quarantine for two weeks and are strict about it, then they would come and stay with us for a week. So nice. believe me, Yay! I was in. Are you still up the lake then, Pam? Yeah. Not a bad place to be. No, it's a great uh, office. We're not rolling an intro today, so they can start right at 7 if they want. Okay, Scott, we have 7 o'clock and there's no intro on MPS, so it, the floor is yours to start this meeting. We're ready to go? Yes, sir. Okay, let's call the meeting to order. Uh, welcome, everybody, and welcome our viewers to the June 8th regularly scheduled meeting of the Midland Public Schools Board of Education. Uh, will you all please join me in rising for the Pledge of Allegiance? Mm -hmm. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Okay, uh, Rob, should we please take roll? Yes. President McFarland. Here. Um, Member Baker. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Lauterbach. Here. Uh, Vice President Singer. Here. Treasurer Fidel. Here. Secretary Roush is here. We have all seven. All right. Thank you. Um, you know, usually we start start off the meetings as upbeat and as possible. Uh, today we're going to kind of start a little bit on a somber note. Um, as you all know, last Thursday uh, there was a construction worker who suffered a fatal injury while working on the East Lawn site. And, and just to the family, um, although I can never pretend to understand, you know, what they're going through, uh, I just want to say to them on behalf of the board that we are so very sorry for your loss and our hearts and prayers go out to you. So, that being said, we're gonna we're gonna move into um, right into the agenda, and that's uh, the consent agenda uh, item three, and we're gonna have approval of the minutes from May 18, uh, 2020. Uh, those also include a number of staff members that are recommended for the employment of the 2021 school year. Uh, those are listed on the agenda. Uh, item 3.3 is the following individuals have announced their resignation on the. Uh, corresponding dates uh, as outlined in the agenda. And item 3.4 is the approval of the payment of the school's bills for the month of April 2020 in the amount of $6,570,536. So with that said, I'll take a motion to approve the consent agenda items. I move we uh, approve the consent agenda items uh, 3.1 through 3.4. Support. Support. Uh, motion was made by Mary, support by Phil. Is there any discussion for the items listed? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, and I apologize, everyone, if I keep looking to my right here. I, I tried to print the agenda so I could have it in front of me, and, and I couldn't get it to print. So I'm, I'm kind of bouncing back and forth between one screen or another. So I, I know it's annoying, but please just bear with me. Okay, uh, next is item four, uh, Board of Education Matters presentations to the board. Uh, this is an information presentation on the uh, 2021 general operating budget. Mr. Bruton. Yes, sir, thank you. Um, I'm gonna get this rolling real quick here. 
PowerPoint coming through okay for everyone? Yes. Very good. Thank you much. So as Mr. McFarland just said, this is our first informational session to the full Board of Education on our 2021 budget. We presented this budget as it appears to you today to FFO last week. Uh, they had a preview of it and this is our time to present it as information to you. And I do appreciate you all moving our final board meeting to June the 29th. And that is the time where we will ask you to act upon this budget, giving time for thought consideration and any comments. So in terms of official timeline, this is the fourth time that we've talked to you about official budget work here this school year. We came to you in January with our first budget revision, which was a little bit earlier than our typical norm. Usually that comes in March, but because we didn't have state numbers until the fall, we had to come and adjust once we knew those numbers. As you'll hear a theme throughout this presentation, that's likely to happen to you again next year, but I would assume that you're gonna see a budget revision much earlier than January, likely sometime in September or October, and we may be amending several times throughout the year more than you saw this year. We had our second budget revision in March, and then in April, we gave you a prediction at the April 20th workshop. And that really was kind of a precursor of some of the uncertainty that we are all really facing right now. When I designed the budget workshop, I had first built it at a $75 increase per student. By the time that I presented it out to the full board, I had moved that to zero. And as you're gonna see tonight, I've moved that drastically in the other direction. And I hope that the numbers that we're building the budget on tonight are wrong in our favor, but that's something that we're just gonna to have to be patient on and see as is every other school district in the state of Michigan right now. So tonight, June the 8th, we are giving you our first um, public hearing on that. This also serves as what is called the truth and taxation hearing. And we will be giving our proposed millage rates for the school year as well too. Following this presentation, we'll be asking for item 4.5, for summer tax resolution for the city of Midland, which will reflect the numbers we're about to talk about right now. And so this budget is gonna be based on the three numbers that you see in front of you. The first millage rate that we're proposing to support the 2021 budget is the 18 mills non-homestead property rate. That number does not change, it's stable, um, is voted in and is active until 2024, where we'll have to go for another renewal in front of the public. The second rate is our hold harmless millage, and it's always appropriate to give everyone just a quick reminder of what that is. Um, when proposal A came in, because we were what is considered an out of formula district, we had the ability to collect an extra $415.31 per student from our local tax base. And at that time, it took a little bit north of five mills to be able to do that. We can only collect $415.31 per student, and that changes based on the number of students that we have and the property-based value that we have to collect from. So every year, we do a pretty comprehensive spreadsheet that gives us the formula of our taxable value of the homes within our jurisdiction, our predicted number of students, and did we over-collect or under-collect in the current year based on the prior year's formula. So there's, again, a complex formula that goes into it. And this year, after putting all the numbers in the spreadsheet and spitting out the formula, it comes in at 1.6486 mills, which is a slight drop. This year, we were at 1.809 mills, so down 0.1604 mills from what the current rate is. And then finally, 2.95 mills, which is our debt service, which is our voted on 2015 and 2019 school building and site funds. Those numbers come directly from a financial firm called PFM. They do a similar calculation as our homestead, but do that based on our outstanding debts and how much money it is that we are supposed to collect to be able to pay our obligations on that debt service. So they suggested that we set that rate at 2.95 for the year. When we get to the summer tax resolution point of it, you won't see these numbers exactly. They're all gonna be cut in half because the city of Midland collects taxes on two cycles. They do a summer and they do a winter. So you'll see a nine, a 0.8243 and a 1.475. So these numbers exactly just cut in half and these are what we're basing uh, the support for our general fund on. I'd like to talk revenues now for our budget and um, it's with a heavy heart that I have to present this first number to you. 
Um, this is going to be the most historic reduction in per pupil foundation um, that has been presented to the Midland Public Schools Board of Education. I think the previous record was $470, and we have been advised by numerous groups to build a budget at $500 reduction per student, $750 reduction per student, and a thousand dollar reduction per student so as we typically do we try and find the middle ground of that and we pick 750 to build our budget on which will take our current foundation allowance of eight thousand six hundred and fifty one dollars and move that to seven thousand nine hundred and one dollars so losing seven hundred and fifty dollars per student is a pretty significant hit for us um, and we will talk about how we will balance this budget using some of our general funds to offset these decreases in revenues. I know that Mr. Cooper and Ms. Klein in the past have stressed to you the importance of what we call categoricals on this end. These are supplementary dollars that come to us in addition to our foundation allowance and also do make up a significant portion of our revenues. We've also been advised by our organizations that our categoricals are, li are likely to take a pretty significant hit as well too. And so without getting too deep into acronym land, which I like to do from time to time, um, I'll just give you the highlights. We are predicting that our 147 categoricals, A1, A2, and E are gonna be eliminated. These are retirement offsets. These are different ways that the state of Michigan will help us pay our retirement obligations. And if these do get defunded or not given to us for revenue, it would be a reduction in our revenue stream of about $1.4 million. In addition, we're making some other predictions. Um, some of the more minor line items that don't have such a high number associated to them by individual, but when you do it by aggregate, adds up to a pretty significant chunk. 104D, 99H, 61D, 61A1, 35A5, 24, and 51F. In um, normal person speak, what that means is first robotics, early literacy, court appointed children, special education, offset, those type of lines. We are predicting that those will likely be eliminated as well. When you add all of those together, we think that that will be approximately an $830,000 reduction in our revenues. And just so you know the method behind our prediction, it is written in school code that certain categoricals are protected from reduction and others are not. And the ones that are not predict, protected are the ones that we've chosen to build as eliminated. And again, we hope that we're wrong and we hope that some of these categoricals come back in. Some of them have direct costs that are associated to them, so it wouldn't have much of an impact on our um, net deficit because it's a direct in and outflow but we thought that we should build a conservative budget for you that is realistic in scope of what could come from the public schools. So we're removing those individual categoricals as well. Um, also in terms of revenues, we know, and we already have this number, that we will be getting approximately $600,000 in one-time revenue. This was from one of the federal stimulus packages came through that is called the CARES Act. Um, we did not build those revenues directly into this budget right now because we have not applied for them from the state yet. The reason we haven't hit the button for official application is that Ms. Miller Nelson has to work with the private schools in town. They are um, eligible to receive portions of these dollars from our allocation. And there's a formula that goes along with that and a mandatory consultation process that has to happen as well too. All of that takes time. And so once we know specifically what we'll be spending those dollars on, we will build that into our first amendment. So we know that we'll have an additional $600,000 of revenue coming in when we talk to you in the early fall with our first budget amendment. We built all of our federal grants at 85% of the fiscal year 20 allocation. We predicted a drop in special education transfers and the IDEA flow through of about $390,000. And then the most significant driver for our budget is always student enrollment. And we work with our consultant and the consultant agreed with what our estimates were on this end as well too. And are building our enrollment at a drop of 65 students, which would put us at a blended count of 7,666 students. And enrollment is gonna be something that we're gonna track close. I know that Mr. Sherrill has been talking to you in Friday letters. 
um, about that. And that's a number that we are going to have to keep watching because each and every single student to the Midland Public Schools means to us what we're predicting is $7,901. So we want to make sure that we're offering a great educational program for anyone with what the comfort level is to um, come back to school in the fall. If we truly do lose 65 students, that would mean a decrease in revenue of $513,565. We did maintain our 31A at risk funding at the current level. That is not a guaranteed source of revenue, but the reason we left it where it is, is I'm having a hard time believing that with um, students coming back to us, being more at risk than they ever have before, that this is a pot of money that the state would touch. Um, they might though, and if they do, it really wouldn't have a significant impact on the deficit that you're gonna see because this is a direct in and out flow. Whatever money that we have coming in, we have a direct expense that's correlated to that. So it would just decrease your revenue and expenditure line at the same time. So it wouldn't have a significant impact, but we did maintain those current levels. Um, in the past, we have seen increases, but when you take all the categoricals and combine them together, an increase sometimes turned into a decrease. This year, with the reduction of $750 per student that we're predicting, along with the categoricals that I just talked with you about briefly, that combines in your budget at a predicted reduction of $930 per student, which again is one of the more historic decreases that we've ever seen um, in Midland Public Schools history and in Michigan School funding history. Um, but there is going to be a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel on this. I, I don't want to be all doom and gloom um, because we have prepared for this type of a situation and we are going to be able to weather the storm much better than um, some of our districts, some of the other districts throughout the state. A closer look at enrollment and the reason that I wanted to present this graph to you is it does paint a bit of a picture you can see that beginning in 2003 and really lasting until around the 2014 school year, we were on a steady decline in students. Even if you were getting per pupil foundation increases, it was hard to combat that loss of students and make your budget fiscally viable. And right around the 2014 timeframe, you can see that that um, decrease in student curve really flattened. And that has been one of the most significant factors in us being able to rebuild our fund balance to be able to be in this financial position that we are now. And we really do attribute that to some of the strategic moves that have been made throughout the district, offering young fives, offering preschool programming, making sure that we are offering IB um, at the secondary and at the early elementary as well too. All of these factors we think have made Midland Public Schools a school of choice and have helped us beat the predictions of the consultants of this steady decline happening. There are not more students being born. We are just simply capturing a higher percentage of the birth rate than has been predicted, which has led to the stability in our enrollment. And that stability is gonna be paramount for us to maintain fiscal viability going into the future. This slide just breaks down these numbers a little bit more for you and breaks it down on an elementary, a secondary, a special education and a blended estimate. And we always try and do a comparison back to 08, 09, kind of a decade-ish mark, and we predict to be around 14.5% below where we were at the 08, 09 school level year. We're breaking down our per pupil foundation. This slide here helps understand where the dollar amount comes in per pupil. As I had stated before, we're predicting a $750 per student drop. So that takes our current allocation of $8,651 per student and makes it $7,901. That $7,901 comes from the formula you see in front of you on the far right in the red. Our $415.31 that I talked about with our whole harmless millage, that always stays the same. So we will always collect that amount. Um, then our local millage non-homestead dollars come from collecting of our taxes from the 18 mil non-homestead and also the taxes in the commercial personal property as well. And then whatever is left over, when you combine both harmless and our local millage, that is the amount that the state of Michigan makes up from the school aid fund, which we're predicting this year to be $5,148.53. So that breaks down how our $7,901 comes out. And when you take some simple math in your head and you do predicted 7,666 students, times $7,901, that comes out to about $60.5 million 
and the rest of the revenue come from categoricals from the enhancement millage and other types of pieces as well too but the largest single sum is our per pupil foundation re-emphasizing why our student enrollment count is so important to us here in middle and public schools so we are predicting a general fund revenue for the 2021 budget at $76,994,607. This is a reduction in revenue from the current fiscal year, March adjustment numbers of just over $7.9 million less coming into the district. And that drop in revenue comes from, again, the $750 cut and those categorical um, components that I explained to you a few slides ago. Shifting from revenues over to expenditures, Mr. Cooper and Mr. Sherrill, when they started their venture about five years ago on this, implemented a balance our budget process, which means that we meet with every single school, every single department in Midland Public Schools in the early spring to talk about what they believe their needs are for the next fiscal year. At that point in time, COVID really wasn't a thing. Um, that really hadn't hit us hard yet. So we were talking in the realm of what are your dreams? What are your hopes? And we now are into a point of what are your needs? And so there are not increases within our buildings and departments with the exception of two, technology and curriculum. And I think that is to be expected because our technology infrastructure needs to be more robust than it ever has been before. And a lot of the components of that technology infrastructure also fall within curriculum, like our new learning management system, Canvas, um, and some of the training that goes along with that. So technology and curriculum saw a slight increase. The rest of the budgets came in around par where they were this year. Our expenditures also include the largest portion of our budget, 86% of our budget this year, is our salaries and our benefits. It includes salary increases for all of our employees, including steps and lane movements that are contractually obligated. And we are predicting at this point a 10% increase in our medical, dental, vision, life, and our long-term disability. Earlier in the year, we were predicting that at 20%. We've done a little bit more digging on that, and 10% looks to be more realistic. We're hoping it's less than that, and we will know those numbers once it gets into the late fall or early winter, and we can make that adjustment if they do come in to our benefit on those lines. It's also built on our health savings account contributions being the same as they were last year with a distribution schedule of two thirds allocation in January and one third in September. I talked before about our federal allocations coming in at 85%. And I do wanna slow down a little bit and talk about our retirement rates. In addition to us predicting that our categorical supplements, our 147 lines that I talked about a few slides back going away, we are also predicting that our contribution rate is going to go up more than what was previously announced. Before the COVID crisis hit, we were informed that we could expect a 1.64% increase in our contribution rate. We've all seen what's happened to the market. Um, hopefully the recovery is going to make this not true, but we are, guessing that we're going to have to contribute an additional 1% on top of that 1.64 to help offset some of the losses that did occur. Again, we hope that we're wrong on this. And if we are, we'll know those true rates when the budget does get released and we can adjust that down in the fall. So hopefully that expenditure line reduces for us as well. But we want to make sure that we are preparing ourselves to be able to meet that obligation if we have to. And then as always, our staffing patterns, we are constantly reflecting upon those, looking at what our best move is in terms of replacing staff, in terms of moving staff around and making sure that we have the best staff and best talent in place to deliver our educational program for the year. So in terms of expenditures, actual, in reality, our expenditures are going to be down next year than where they were at the March adjustment. So you are seeing expenditures that are reduced by approximately $389,000, just south of $390,000 versus what the March budget adjustment was. And you can see in the far right in red where some of the increases and some of the decreases were. Um, increases expected in salaries and benefits as presented each of the employee groups. Um, people do step, they move lanes, and there was a contractual obligation for those wage increases. Our largest reduction you can see is the very bottom right, which is our fund modification. That's a fancy term for the transfer that we've been making from the general fund to our capital projects fund. 
And um, when we do have budget surpluses, it's a great thing to be able to silo those dollars for much needed capital projects. But when you're gonna be adopting deficit budgets, we don't think that that's a wise investment. We need to put every single dollar that we can into instructional programming. So we are not planning on making that $1 million transfer that we have the past couple of years. So net net in terms of expenditure comparisons, you see between this fiscal year and next fiscal year, a drop in expenditures of around $390,000. It's probably appropriate this time as well too, to let you know that we've been proactively working on this end. We are going to be making reductions and strategic decisions within our budget on the fly per se. And we will be actively seeking to reduce expenditures in any area that we possibly can without hurting educational programming to make sure that when we do get to the end of next year that we are being um, stewards of our dollars and making sure that we're trying to reduce the deficit as much as we possibly can. When you break it down by account, this reflects the statistic I gave you a few moments ago. 86% of our budgets are salaries and benefits. The other 14% is made up of the items that you see in the right purchase service, contracted services, um, capital outlay, and other various expenses. When you break it down by function, this is the way that the state comes up with the chart that I shared with you during our budget workshop called State Bulletin 1014. When it compares how Midland Public Schools ranks in terms of how much money we invest in the classroom versus how much we invest in maintenance and into our administration services as well too. And so this shows that we are putting 77.3% of our funds by function directly into student and instructional supports, which reflects the priorities within our budget. So the snapshot of the budget, when you are comparing your 2019-20 March adjustment to the original proposal that you're seeing in front of you, the numbers now repeat themselves on this slide. Our revenue reductions are about $7.9 million less than the revenues that we are anticipating to see this year. That again comes from the $750 per student reduction combined with the categorical decreases. Our expenditures, as I said a few moments ago, are about $390,000 less than they were. We have been using for the past couple years a 1.5% expected variance, which would give us just shy of $1.3 million expected budget variance, which puts you at a total anticipated shortfall of about $8.1 million versus where we are this year of around $561,000. When you get to that total impact, which we don't believe it will be that high by the time we get to the end, that would take your unassigned fund balance and move it from just south of 18 million to just north of $10 million. And when it comes to percentages of expenditures, that would be from 20.7% to 11.6%. Unassigned is not our total fund balance. Total fund balance numbers would go from a predicted 25.5% year-end close to 16.7% year-end close. This is a slide that Mr. Cooper and Ms. Klein started long ago, and usually I kind of glance through it, but I do want to spend a little bit of extra time this year because there's lessons to be learned from here and something that should give us a little bit of hope to be able to glean onto. If you can see and you can squint your eyes and look at some of the fine data and you take a look at the 11-12 school year all the way through the 2014-15 school year, in the pink column you'll see in the 11-12 school year that nearly a $7 million deficit budget was adopted by the board at this time during that school year. When they ended up closing the books at the end of the audit, they ended up at a $1.3 million deficit. And if you look at 12-13, 13-14, and 14-15 where those were not so attractive numbers, a $7 million deficit, a $6 million deficit. At the end of each fiscal year, through strategic reductions, um, administration and stakeholders, teachers, through their hard work, was able to reduce the obligation of general fund support um, to fractions of what was predicted. This is a lesson of history that we intend to repeat. This is something that we're going to be working hard on doing. And even though the number in front of you is not pretty, we understand that and get that. It is a direct result of the most historic cut in per pupil funding that we've ever seen. And we're gonna be actively working to adjust those down. As I said before, I am hoping that most of the predictions that I made for you are completely and 100% wrong. Those are not words that you, you will hear come out of my mouth, hopefully in the future. Usually we like to give you a budget that I can say, I am 
firm in my guess. I think that I'm going to be off by a couple percent here and there. I hope I'm off by a whole bunch to our favor, but we won't know until we get the numbers from the state on this. So we're going to build this budget to give you a realistic picture of what we think it could be and actively work to make the numbers in our favor. This slide isn't really to, um, it's actually meant to remind us to continue to advocate for fair funding for public education. This is something that Linda Klein started, actually Bob Markey started way before Linda Klein. And what they did was they tracked the foundation allowance, the per people amount that we get and compared it to the consumer price index and tracked over time. If the foundation allowance were to have kept up with the increase in consumer price index, what our per pupil funding should be. So I plugged those numbers in again this year and the gap continues to increase. If we'd have kept up with the consumer price index, we'd be at $11,668 per student versus what our predicted $7,901 per student allocation is um, on paper, which is the gap of $3,767 per student. And so while we understand that the COVID crisis is unprecedented, that gap existed before, and we know that we need to continue to advocate at, uh, with our local legislators and also at the state level as well too, to make sure that we are funding public education properly. Our fund balance chart, this is something that reflects the decrease that I have showed you within this budget. And I also wanna point out to you, and it, you probably can see my cursor moving, once I come to you at the next board meeting, these two final bars are probably going to move, the 20 estimate and the 21 estimate. This fiscal year 20 estimate is based on us predicting that we'll have to dip into our fund balance this year by $560,000. We are closing out this current fiscal year budget as we speak. We're getting receipts and books in from all of our buildings. We fully anticipate bringing to you a balanced budget at the end of this year, if not adding to a surplus with a major footnote asterisk, if the state does not prorate our per pupil funding this year. There are rumors that that could happen. I've heard rumors all the way up to 750 to $1,000 per student this year as well too. Um, Mr. Shero and I are pretty adamant. We believe that that's not going to happen, but there could be something. Um, if that does happen, then we'll have to adjust the numbers to reflect that. But if it does not happen and we are given the amount of money that we were promised at the beginning of the year, we anticipate that these bars will move a little bit on you, meaning that the percentages I shared with you a few slides back will be up a little bit more with the predictions. And so we will continue to monitor our books. You're gonna give us the opportunity to bring you more accurate numbers than we've had in the past because of the additional week that you basically allotted us to be able to try and bring you more accurate numbers. Hopefully by that time, we'll know if there is a proration or not. Hopefully the answer is not. And then we can move forward with um, an adoption with a little bit more confidence in the numbers that we have. And so before I close out, there's three main points that I wanna make about this budget. The first is that there's always gratitude that needs to go out. This process, having experienced it in this chair for the first time, actually started in January and there are hundreds of hours that go into the development of the numbers that you see. As stated, we meet with every single building and the building put hours into it from the office professionals to the teachers, to the department heads, to the principals, assistant principals, athletic directors, they all put lots of time into really truly trying to give us a budget that they know will deliver a quality educational program. And then that comes to Lori Holderby and the business office, and they really do a lion's share of the work in generating these numbers. This is one of the more complicated predictions we've ever had to go through. As stated, when we go to a budget workshop, we usually are pretty close and dialed into what our predictions are gonna be. We've changed this four times already in between the budget workshop and what you see now. And we're predicting that it's probably gonna change again in the early fall and we'll do more budget amendments than we ever have before. So my sincere gratitude to the many stakeholders that have done their diligence in putting these numbers forward to you. Number two point that I wanna make is that do credit needs to go to the board and to all of our stakeholders for putting us in a position where we have the ability to present this budget to you in its state that it is. We have a very healthy general fund that can help us support and deliver a quality educational program to students in a time where we know that they're gonna need more supports than they ever have before. If we didn't do diligence in the past and build that healthy fund balance, 
we would be slashing programming that we know would be at the detriment of students. There are districts that are talking of cutting art, cutting music, cutting sports, and just offering bare essentials. We don't have to have that conversation right now, and that's because if we put ourselves in a good financial position to be able to absorb this blow for a period of time. If this persists in this last two or three years, then these are decisions that we're gonna to have to strategically make. But as of now, we have the ability to be able to absorb this, and that is an absolute blessing because we know that these supports are needed. And that just leads me to the final point that we know that we can't be negligent. We can't ignore a generation of students that we know is facing a higher adversity than many of the previous generations that come before. Middle Public Schools is gonna offer an excellent educational program next year. There is not a program that is cut in this budget. We're gonna to continue to offer actually additional options in terms of blended and virtual options more than we have before with more robust technology supports than we have before. And we're gonna actively work throughout the year to protect that programming while also making strategic <coughs> budget moves to make sure that that historical slide repeats itself as well. So we are not panicked by the budget that we're presenting to you. We are concerned like everyone because we can't do this for three to five years, but we know that we can do this for a short period of time and hopefully that the economy can recover, get us back to our funding levels that we know will help us continue to grow in the fashion that we were as well before. So with that said, um, I'll open it up to any questions that you may have about this budget. And then Scott, you'll have to go into a budget hearing for any public comment. Okay. Uh, Brian, your, your, your final closing points, I think were an excellent summation uh, of the, the entire presentation. And more, more to the point, um, I think they're gonna address a lot of the public's concern that there's an $8.1 million shortfall, the sky is falling. What are we gonna do? Well, yeah, but we've got a really big umbrella and, and you guys put us there and put us in this position to, to weather the storm, like you said. So, you know, I just wanna say thank you. You guys have really done an outstanding job working countless hours, getting us to the point where we are today, where, like you said, other districts, they don't know what they're gonna do. Um, we're gonna keep charging forward and we're gonna keep taking care of our kids. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I, I'm sure maybe some of the other board members may have some more direct questions for you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Brian. And um, it is, I'm uh, happy to know that we are in a good position. And I knew going into this that we're in a better position than most districts in the state. And that should make our community feel uh, very good about the district and, and how we're gonna get through the next year and two years. Um, I guess the thing uh, I'm, I've got questions about or, or maybe the community does is when you talk about um, things, lessons learned from the past and, and ways that we might um, find additional savings, can you give us some ideas of what you're, what you're talking about? I'll take that one, Brian. Sure. So, Brian, I'll take that one. Yeah. Yeah, probably best for me to take that. Um, yes, sir. So, Pam, we, we've already identified a little over a million dollars um, of savings that will be enacted after July 1. So it's through attrition that we'll use that process as we go forward. So every position in the district that comes available, we will look at can this be um, filled in, in a different capacity. And we, we know we can do some of that as we go forward, as we have in the past. So when you talked about past practices, you know, when I arrived here seven years ago, you were down to a 6% fund balance. Um, our, our revenue certainly didn't increase um, large enough to bring us to the financial position we did. We became a more efficient organization. We cut back expenditures. If you just take the $1 million that we didn't spend are going to move into capital improvements, right there you begin to gain. And so as we move that along and um, a little bit of um, enrollment help, which is a very fluid unknown right now, if say enrollment does not get drastically hit because of the COVID crisis, um, I believe that 8.1, just like our past practices, as Brian had pointed out to you, will be reduced by 50, 60 percent by the time we close a book a year from now. Now, can I bank on that? Should I have Brian present that? No way we should do that. We, we, we need to plan accordingly that, that way. 
So it's usually through attrition at this point in time we make those reductions as we go forward. A second year, so a year from now we're sitting here and the state still has not been able to increase that state foundation allowance. Um, all, all games are off. We have to begin to, at that point, decide that we're going to have to make some very tough decisions on reducing staff and reducing probably some programming or, or getting a little skinnier in all those programs. But we are, we are not to that point today. Thanks, Mike. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, anybody else, any questions or comments for Brian or Mike? Okay, we're gonna move it. Thank you, Brian. Weird, I'm sorry, did someone say something? Yeah, I had a question. Um, oh, hey, Brad, sure. Is there any opportunity for any alternate funding um, relative to our current state with uh, what the governor is going to recommend to President Trump about our situation with the flood? Does that present, in any situation, does that present any dollars to schools? So I don't think flood-related, Brad, but I think you are on to something. So the hope, if you watch public school districts throughout the state, is, a, is another federal government bailout. Um, and so th there, there is belief that there will be another care package coming. Um, if you, and, and, Brad, you, you weren't in the school business, but I'm sure you remember what we all called Obama aid. Um, back in the day. Um, so those dollars potentially could come, like the CARES Act money that Brian talked about, another aid package. And if we're real creative in what we do with it, we often can, can um, cover salaries. The CARES Act right now can be used for salaries, is what they've said. They've opened those rules up. And so we'll offset some of those costs, back to where Pam said, Pam's question as well, is we'll offset some of those costs as we begin to use the CARES Act. The belief is there's another package coming. You've seen some of that going on in D.C. Um, the problem, I think, what's held it up is a lot of pork in there, and this ne next package is needed for, school, for state school districts. We're not the only one. And small cities and townships who were not covered in the CARES Act. So I do think there may be some uh, benefit of that coming. I don't think on the flood that there's going to be any benefit for us um, coming on the aid of it for schools. When we talk grants and dollars, remember this, a lot of people will talk about it, 90-some uh, percent of grants are just flow through. So grants always come with restrictions. Um, and so if we get money um, to cover something, it's usually you also spend it in this way so it doesn't um, supplant um, already cost. The CARES Act, lucky for us, is pretty wide open, and we're going to be able to use some of that to offset salaries. Okay, um, anybody else? All right, thanks, Mike. We're gonna move into item 4.2. This is the public hearing portion of the 2020-2021 general operating budget. And to any community members that are attending this meeting virtually or in person, I don't know if there's anybody in the in the room with you, Mike. Uh, this is the point, everyone, where of the meeting where you're invited to address the board regarding these budget matters only. Uh, there is going to be a point later in the meeting when you can address the board with general questions and comments, uh, but now is the time if there if you have a question to, to talk to the board about budget issues only. Scott, the there's open. no one here present, and I'm looking at the list of folks here. Um, I think we're all school personnel. Some of us are obviously are community members as well. Amy Beasley would be the only one. I don't think that's why you're here today, right, Amy? But um, you could comment, and so the rest is staff at this point. Okay, I, I'm sorry, Mike. I'm having a hard time hearing you. So there are no there are no comments or requests, correct? Keep it open. Okay. But I don't believe so. Unless so we'll Amy move on. Well. We'll close out item 4.2 then, and we're going to move into an action item. This is item 4.3. Uh, this is the Michigan High School Athletic Association. Mike. So as most of you are aware of, MHSA is our private organization that we choose to become a member of. It, it is not a, a regulating body of the state. All schools choose to be a member. When you do so, you also choose to enforce the rules of the Michigan High School Athletic um, Association. So we are looking for your approval to once again join MHSSA as our sanctioning body for athletics. Okay. Can we get a motion, please? I move to approve item 4.3. Uh, uh, joining MHSAA or approval to 
re-up our joining that organization. Scott, do you need the official readout from Cindy? No, you do not. The resolution will be attached to the meeting uh, minutes, and so you don't necessarily have to read those out, Phil. At one okay. time we did, but... Good question, Phil. Any support for Pam's motion? Yep, support. Okay. Motion by Pam, support by Phil. Any discussion for item 4.3? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Aye. Item 4.3 passes. Uh, next up, we have item 4.4. .4. This is another action item, the 2021 salary letter for, M for the MPS employee groups. Uh, Brian. Yes, sir. Thank you. It is the appropriate time for us to approve the salary lo levels for next year. These salary levels are what the budget was built upon that we just presented to you and reflects the salary increase in wage allocations for our affiliated and for our non-affiliated groups. For our affiliated groups, these are simply our contractual obligations translated onto paper. So there are no changes in there from varying from what our contractual obligations are. And for our non-affiliated groups, these wage ranges were discussed with FFO throughout the year and reflect what those discussions were. So on average, there are salary increases ranging from two to 5% based on what group it is and where you would be within that group on what the actual impact is. The contributions towards employees HSAs is staying the exact same as it is now. And also the employees obligations for their contribution to their, their health insurance is also the exact same as it was before. So this salary letter allows us on our end to be able to generate our contracts on this end. And it's something that we ask for your annual approval on. That's the salary range for every single employee in the district, with the exception of the superintendent, which is a separate contract that the board enters into. So we seek your approval on the salary letter so that we can get those contracts written and solidify the numbers within our budget. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, I'll accept the motion for item 4.4, .4, please. I make the motion that we accept the salary letter for MS our MPS employee groups. Support. Support. Okay. Motion by Mary. Support by John. Any discussion? Okay. Thank you, Brian. Uh, all in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Okay. Uh, 4.4 .4 carries. Next up, uh, we have another action item. This is item 4.5. This is the summer tax rate. Uh, Brian, back to you. Thank you. So these numbers reflect what I showed you in slide two of the budget presentation. Where I said that there are taxes that we need to establish at this point in time. This resolution is going to apply to the city of Midland. You are going to have me come back to you again, not at the next board meeting, but in July. We'll pass a broader resolution, which will establish the rates officially through a form that we call the L4029. But at this point in time, the city of Midland needs to get their summer tax collections prepared and set and out. So they appreciate us sending them the rates. So the numbers that you see in that resolution, the resolution really has two parts to it. The whole first page says, whereas a whole bunch of times, and that sets the legal statutes that allow us to be able to collect it. But the real um, rates are set in the sections that say, therefore it be resolved. And there are four numbers in there that we are asking you to approve tonight that were directly reflected on the slide two that I talked about before. The first number was the non-homestead rate of 18 mills, but we're only asking for half, so the form says nine. The second was the hold harmless rate, which in the slides we said was this year going to be 1.6486. So the number you see resolved for you there is 0.8243 mills, which is half of that. The third number is our commercial personal property rate, which is six mills, half of that being three. And then our debt service or bond collection full rate being 2.95 and for these purposes 1.475. So this will allow me to send this resolution over to the city, allow them to prepare their summer tax rules. And again, I will be back to you in July for an official declaration on the L4029, which will have the whole numbers proposed in it and allow me to send that to the other jurisdiction. So we'd appreciate um, you approving this tonight so we can help the city of Midland out 
with an earlier time frame to get their tax resolution prepared. Scott, this is a roll call vote. Yes, sir. I move to approve item 4.5, the summer tax rates. Court. Okay, uh, motion by Pam, support by Lynn. Uh, do, we, do we need the? Do we need it read the way Cindy sent it out this morning? That was, was there a resolution to read? I, I'm sorry, I may have missed it. Yeah. Okay. If you got it right there, no. John, you want to read it? Sure. Uh, I move. Uh, I move to approve the resolution certifying the tax rate that is to be levied in the summer of 2020 on the property of the school district within the city of Midland. A complete copy of the resolution shall be attached to the original of these minutes. Support. support. Okay, motion by John, support by Phil. Um, any discussion regarding the summer tax rate resolution? Okay, now we need a roll call vote, please. All right, President McFarland. Yes. Vice President Singer. Yes. Secretary Rausch, yes. Treasurer Fidel. Yes. Member Baker. Yes. Member Blazy. Yes. Member Lauterbach. Yes. Okay. All right. That sounded like 7 0 to me. Uh, that motion passes. Uh, Brian, next up, we have item 4.6. This is the workers' compensation insurance. Yes, thank you. So about every three years, we will go out and bid our insurance packages. And this year, it was due for us to bid our workers' compensation package. So we did some preparation work, put it out to bid, and we're pleased that we had four bidders on our workers' compensation this year. At the review from administration and FFO, we are recommending to you that we award the next fiscal year workers' compensation insurance to the Yider Insurance Agency for $65,187. Okay, thank you. Um, any motions for item 4.6? I'll make a motion to approve item 4.6, workers' compensation. Support. Okay. That was Mary? Yes. Okay, motion by Phil, support by Mary. Um, any discussion? All right. Um, all in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Uh, thank you. Next up, we have item, another action item, 4.7. This is Chromebook purchase. Uh, Brian. This comes to you, I think it was two Friday letters back, correct me if I'm wrong on that, um, that because of the result of the flooding, we now know that there were a significant amount of devices from both the staff and students that were damaged within the floods. We don't know an exact number. We are working on those right now as students are turning those in through the various different collections that are going on. But we are anticipating through survey data from what we've heard from staff and students that we are gonna need an additional amount of devices to be able to support construction next year. Because procurement of these devices is more difficult than it has been in the past, we wanted to make sure that we got a purchase order out as soon as we possibly could. And so the purchase order that we're asking you to formally approve tonight is to Presidio. This is the exact same company that we granted the purchase order to a couple of meetings back for the middle school Chromebooks for the exact same price of $263 per device. That's $239 for the physical device and $24 per license. And for 250 of those, that comes out to $65,750. This pricing comes to you from the state spot bid that we use in the past to procure the best possible price for these devices. So we are seeking your official approval of this purchase order tonight. Okay. Uh, motion for item 4.7, please. Well, motion for approval of item 4.7, the Chromebook purchase. Uh, the total sixty-five thousand seven hundred fifty dollars. Support. Uh, motion by Phil. Support by Mary. Any discussion? Brian, has this purchase order been released already? I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit. Has this purchase order been released already to Presidio? Yes, sir. Okay. 
I'm glad that you were able to uh, get that out and maybe be able to actually acquire those before the start of the school year. Yep, we're hoping. Do you, yeah. have, any, do you have any feedback on that from them about the odds of getting those in a timely fashion? They're hopeful early August, but Mr. Diedzik, um, you can affirm or tell me that I'm wrong on that. We're still, still looking for August. For August. Um, well, I don't have that big deck here. Um, the ones we may still start yet, yet, though. I can say it for you if you want. Yeah. yeah, we're hoping for early August. There could be a little bit of delay there. And, and the reason we did the emergency part of that is um, we we don't want to start the school year with um, minus devices. If you recall, we had a little bit of that issue last year. So, um, you know, we felt the purchase was necessary, needed to get it moving once we heard, and you know, the damage of those. So, Demand has become much more complicated throughout the state because I'm sure, as you can imagine, every school district is trying to get as many devices as they possibly can. So procurement has been an issue, and um, we appreciate Dave being proactive and getting on that bid for us. Actually, it's throughout the country. The, you know, the most schools, all schools being closed down, the, the, the orders went in big for, for Chromebooks. So it's yet to be known, I guess. Okay, any further discussion? All right, thank you for staying ahead of that, um, Brian and Mike and, and Dave. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, item 4.7 passes. It looks like uh, the next action item is 4.8. This is the Northwest, I'm sorry, Northeast Pool Repair. Brian. Thank you. Earlier in the year, we were approached by the community center with an inspection report on the Northeast Pool that was reporting the pool was losing water at an abnormal rate. So we've had some detailed analysis done of that. And it is showing that we are in drastic need of recoding of that pool of the MARS site replacement for that. And our inspection report said that if we did not have this MARS site recoding done, that they would not open up that pool for us come fall. So this is a necessary repair to extend the life of this pool, which we know is a very needed commodity for the stakeholders that use the product facilities within this community. So we put this out to bid. We did only receive one bid from Advanced Pool Services, but this is a company that we have used before. They did the exact same type of repair, Marsite replacement on HH Dow High Pool, and the pricing was in line with what they did for us on HH Dow High. So we are confident in their pricing and knowing that we are getting a clear deal from them. So we are recommending tonight that you grant Advanced Pool the purchase order for the Marsite recording and also for recording the gutters for a grand total of $41,800. Okay, thank you. Uh, any motion for item 4.8, please? Make a motion to approve item 4.8 to advance pool services for $41,800. Support. Motion by Phil, support by Lynn. Uh, any discussion? Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, item 4.8 passes. Next up is an information item. This is HH Dow High Surf Pro Media Center Repair. Back to you, Brian. Thank you. So this was the second of the purchase orders that Mike wrote to you about in the post-flood Friday letter. This was a service agreement that we had to enter into as soon as we possibly could because we had to get the water clean and we had to make sure that we weren't getting mold within our media center over at Dow High. Since then, um, as time has progressed, we now know that the extent of the damage that we have over at HH Dow High, we have used ServPro to pull the carpet, to do the moisture removal, um, drying things out with the fans, etc. And now we know that we are going to have to replace the furniture and also the flooring over there at Dow High. So we are going to be bidding the flooring ourselves. So that's something that we'll be bringing to you at a future board meeting. Um, and we are also going to have to look at replacing that furniture, which we are currently analyzing from our bond purchases to see if we can replace it one for one if that furniture even exists um, anymore. We think that it does, so we're analyzing those. So we wanted to bring this for you 
as an informational item that we did enter into that agreement. There was not time because of the sensitivity of the urgency for the situation. We want to let you know that we did enter into that agreement and we will be bringing you future purchase orders as applicable um, based on what we learned from the estimates and from the bidding process for the repairs and for the replacement that we need. We have filed an insurance claim and we're, we have filed with FEMA, but I, there's not a lot of hope we're going to get a large settlement there. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any, any questions uh, regarding that topic before we move on to item five? Okay. Is, is there a duplicate? Hey, Scott, is there a duplication of these in our packet or are there two different contracts? Brian? Uh, good question. We're not working hey, off multi screens hey, real well, but give us a second. We'll look. Is there a contract? Can you see? I think one is just the signed copy, and the other is the original, is what it's looking like. But I'll just log in and confirm that. We kind of estimate it for FEMA. Um, we also have damage to the electronic sign. If you've noticed, been by Dow High, it's not functioning either. It had water damage as well. And so we did a, um, the best we could to estimate, and we were told to estimate high. I think we filed 200000 So, um, it, you know, it could cost that high to get it all back to normal, but we don't believe it will be quite that high. But Yes, Mr. Blaze, it appears to be a duplicate. Okay. Okay, everybody else good? All right, item five, this is request to address the board. Are there any requests to address the board by any of the members of the public watching or present? Hearing none, we'll move on to item six. This is FFO and 6.1, I believe we have minutes from Mary. Mary, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Yes, that is correct. I have the minutes and it's from the June 1st meeting. Um, Mr. Shower and Mr. Bruton discussed the following topics with the committee. The April financials, revenue and expenditures were reviewed. A reduction in April's year to year expenditures was noted as uh, applicable to the COVID-19 shutdown, uh, shutdown. Purchase order and card transactions above bid threshold were reviewed. Um, we had discussed the workman's compensation insurance bid, which we had uh, talked about here and approved. The Northeast pool bid, which we have approved. The dam failure emergency, emergency purchase orders correlating to the damages were reviewed. And um, we discussed the 2021 budget, which Brian so nicely presented to us here tonight. Um, the next FFO meeting is Monday, July 6th at 5 p.m. Okay, thanks, Mary. Uh, next up, we have items 6.2 through 6.4. Brian, do you want to just take them all? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Item 6.2 is informational. This is the gift of items. And we are proud to present that Seabird Elementary was gifted a customizable four pack of robots. And this is attributed to the hard work of the Dow High sophomore, Ava Nelson, as the chief science officer and her award that she procured as through the SVSU chief officer program. So thank you to Ava. And item 6.3 are seven gifts for information totaling $7,203.35. And they range from food service scholarships to landscaping supplies that were donated by the Northeast Viking Parents Association, and we will recognize each of those individual donors in the credits of this meeting. And then item 6.4 will require your action. There are three gifts within item 6.4 with a grand total of $632,317.83. Two of those gifts are for the HH Dow Turf Project, which is $400,000 from the Gerstacker Foundation and 
from the Midland Area Community Foundation Dow High Turf Project. It came from what's called the Spiffy Fund, which was procured largely from community donors. So we appreciate those. And then finally, the last gift within that grand total is $32,016. That comes from the Arthur C. Frock Endowment Fund from the Midland Community Foundation. And that is the grant that helped us purchase the temperature sensor tablets that we approved in a previous board meeting. That requires your action tonight to approve. Um, can I get a motion for item 6.4, please? I make the motion that we approve uh, and accept gifts totaling $632,317.83. Support. Support. Okay. Motion by Mary. Support by John. Any discussion, guys? Scott, I think I'm going to probably not participate in the voting since I'm involved with the project of my business. So yes, sir. I understand. Conflict of interest. I will not be participating in your vote. Thank you, Brad. We appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other comments? Just to right. accept those gifts. Just um, outstanding. Needed. Yeah, it really is, and it, and it just it just kind of highlights what we've already seen following the dam failures. That you know this community is is absolutely wonderfully supportive uh, of of each other and of the infrastructure within. So, and this 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 shows that just as clear as can be. Uh, so, thank you to the private donors. Thank you to the foundations. Um, with that, all in favor of supporting the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Next up, we are in human resources. This is item 7.1, Mr. Jaster. Good evening. The MPS board and staff extend their deepest sympathy to the families of Mr. Siegfried Jashinsky, who passed away March 31st, 2020. Mr. Mr. Jashinsky had been the head custodian at Midland High School for 27 years, and he retired in 1993. Also to the family of Mr. Glenn Waters, who passed away on May 17th, 2020. He was a junior and senior high school shop teacher for 34 years. He retired in 1976. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up, we have item eight. This is correspondence to and from the board. Uh, those are outlined in the, uh, the agenda. Um, next up is the item nine. That's our scheduled list of upcoming uh, board meetings. And finally, that brings us to item 10 study uh, discussion session. I know Phil and Pam do have a couple comments that uh, they would like to make. Um, those aside, are there any issues that any board member uh, would like to see studied in further detail or any points of clarification need to be made? Okay, uh, Pam, I'm sorry, Scott, Brad, go ahead. Can I get an update on the flooring for Midland High School. It's part of our packet, but it wasn't discussed. And I don't know if Mike's going to update us on that at the end of the meeting or if that's going to be now. So what's your question on it, Brad? I wasn't going to, but I'd be glad to answer what I can. Well, there's information in our packet about the flooring at Midland High School of the, of the, the moisture and things that had to be done. And we couldn't find somebody to do that, but we did find somebody to do that. So where do we stand in that? Yeah, sure. Brian, I think you're going to take that, right? Yeah, yeah, I can take that. So as a part of the bidding for the first floor over at Midland High School, we were installing LVT over there. And it was recommended that we also do moisture mitigation for that as well, too, to make sure that the life of that is extended, that we would get the roof along with those tiles. When we went out to seek a vendor to do that for us, we discovered that there was only one vendor in the entire United States that was approved to actually do that application. When we called the company on it, they said that our warranty would only be guaranteed if a certified vendor was utilized. So we did a little bit of diligence on that to ensure that pricing that we were getting from that vendor was appropriate. It was the exact same vendor that we had used on a similar product over at Adams, and we're actually getting pricing that was better than the installation that we had over at Adams, so we know that the pricing was fair. We also then went and talked to our auditor about this because we're never comfortable with sole source vendors on things, 
and our auditor was comfortable with it if we do a couple of things. One, secure a letter from the company that said that this was the only certified vendor to ensure that our pricing wasn't of a gouging level. And again, as I just said, we know that it was appropriate and fair and actually better than we've had before. And then in addition, wanted us to document all of that so that if questions were to arise, we would have evidence of that. And so the documentation, your package is what you saw. We did work with our vendor and our companies to make sure that we were doing that in an appropriate way. So we are confident that that um, procurement of service is the best option for Midland Public to make sure that we are getting the warranty on that model in case there are future issues on it. Have they started that work? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. And the, and the moisture mitigation is working? Hopefully. Yeah, I think they're, they're doing it as we speak. Yeah, I think okay. the tile was removed last week. They probably just started today on the mitigation. I think was it was where they were, and then after asbestos abatement, moisture mitigation, and actual laying of the LVT, the project was delayed just a touch by the turning of Midland High into a shelter because that first floor is the gym. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Um, hearing no other issues, Pam, uh, the floor is yours. I know you had a, a comment you wanted to make. Um, yeah, thank, thanks, Scott. Of course. Uh, this last week, uh, I've been thinking a lot about our uh, families and friends in our community who have dealt with race issues. And I know there's a lot of hurt going on right now. And um, there was a, a, a wonderful show of support in Midland um, after the death of George Floyd, and I'm, I'm very proud of our community, and I just wanted to say that I recognize that our schools have work to do to create a more open and welcoming district. I recognize that the work must happen at every level in each one of our lives in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our community, and in our nation. And I know there are no easy fixes and that challenging conversations and work are ahead of us. And I wanted to say I'll do my part to listen, to learn, to take action, to ensure I can continue to contribute in making positive change. And it wasn't a month ago that Penny and Amy came to us with the MPS inclusion and diversity vision where everyone in our school community is safe, valued, treated with kindness and respect and works together to make our community and world a better place. And I feel like we have a lot of very strong people in our community that um, we're coming together and, and creating strategy and action steps towards a better future. And um, I just wanted to reach out to those families who are hurting and letting them know that um, we hear them. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, we appreciate that. Thank you for the comments. Uh, Phil. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, you know, I think it's incumbent upon us as the board to take a leadership position for our district exactly in light of what Pam was just talking about. I think I, I speak for the board when I say, you know, I pre we appreciate all the work that Penny and, and Amy have put into really laying the foundation for a DEI plan and vision for our district. And it's it's time for us as a board to take a lead. So I'd like to propose two things tonight and uh, Scott, maybe we'll handle them one at a time. The first would be all of us and need, need additional education in this space and um, learning and listening. So I'd like to propose that we hold a board workshop um, and, and 
the, you know, we can continue to work on the agenda for that, but it would be, you know, first and foremost, more learning and education for us as a board um, and, and really coalescing our own personal commitment and our board commitment to that vision statement of DEI. And third agenda item would be really how, how are we as a board going to measure success for the district as we work towards this vision? Um, and how do we measure improvement and, and know that we're getting the positive outcomes that we want? Um, so that, that would be the first um, motion that I would make. Oh, okay. Um, so I, Scott, there's two ways, and and Phil, I see, I, I see a little spot here. You can either make a motion, get a second, take a vote, or you as a for president, because it's a anytime the board meets with a quorum, it's a public meeting, and we have to post it as a board meeting. So you as a president have the ability to call a board meeting um, on that topic and have a workshop. So there's two ways that you can do that for a little direction for your for the board here. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I support the idea of the workshop. Um, I, I agree with you that we, we all need, you know, we can use work in this area. And, you know, we've got an in-house expert that can help us with that. Um, so the workshop will, will obviously have to be coordinated with Dr. Beasley, and we will rely heavily upon her for content uh, and for education, uh, quite frankly. Um, and then it has to be done consistent with the uh, uh, the meeting requirements in terms of announcements and having an open board meeting. So it may not just be limited to us, which is not a bad thing, uh, but we do have to have it as an open meeting. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know, though. I, I think that's something we we can we can explore. I don't know if it's it's a motion that we make though, because we really don't have a date in mind. Um, yeah, so at your direction, Scott, we'll, we'll work, I'll go, Penny and I will work with Dr. Beasley, and we will um, figure a, a topic out, try to f find a joint date that works for all of you and a time. We'll send that out in a calendar right, and when she's, that allows her as well to prepare whatever material okay. she has and a date that okay. will work for let's all of you. Okay, let's pursue that. We'll post Please, it as a Mike, board uh, meeting and then go from let's there. Get, that. Let's try and get that set up. We can do and that. And then, Phil, the, the second part of your... Yeah, the the, sec the second part is going back to to you know if we recall Dr. Beasley's presentation, the the governance side of of um, putting a DAI strategy in place, and that's really thinking about how more formally each of our subcommittees can make a commitment to actively speaking and discussing and, and making sure that DEI is part of our decision making process. So. But what I would propose to, to the board is that um, each of our subcommittees um, have it as a standing action item on our agendas um, and report out formally in our in our readouts of our subcommittee minutes that we uh, about what we talked about in the space because you know when we do this correctly, DEI is part of every decision that we make and it's part of every, uh, it, it's at the root of making sure that every single kid in our our district has the same opportunity and, and, and same success at the end of the day. Um, so okay. last, last month I heard, uh, I heard Mr. Lauterbach. Uh, Mike, I'm not sure how we go about doing that. Uh, I know you and I had this conversation about this very topic it's already done. So I heard John say that request last week or last month, and um, we've already put that onto each of the four sub board subcommittees. Okay, so that's already that's already in motion. So FFO will have that lens and be and on their agenda item. Um, HR will have that on there. Minister of Services kind of has because it's policy, but we'll have that on there as well. And. Um, I'm missing one. What did I skip over here? CIA curriculum instruction assess assessment pretty much kind of has been because that's where it's kind of been its home um, as we ventured down this avenue. But we will make it an agenda item in each piece of it um, going forward. So I thought I okay. I thought I heard John say that. So 
Excellent. Thank you. Phil, two excellent points. Pam, thank you very much. Uh, with that being said, uh, Phil, is there anything else that we needed to flush out in terms of your final thoughts? No, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I just am excited for our work as a board to, to lead the way on this charge. I am too. Thank you for, for bringing that up tonight. Um, okay, Mike, the floor is yours. Yeah, I'm going to be a little shorter tonight. We've got two board meetings this month. I really don't need to cover everything. But um, I do want to make the board aware that um, I'm a little concerned a little bit about my, um, my staff here, um, those who are sitting here and sitting in front of their computers particularly. So I just want to give you a little bit of a rundown. Um, anxiety, stress, and workload has been quite high over here. The people that I work around have been working somewhere between 70 and 80 hours a week. And you say, how can they get that in? Well, that's Saturday and Sunday, too, because they're working Saturday and Sunday. And for the most part, we're working back and forth to 8, 9 o'clock in the evening with the topics that have been going on. And so, you know, I think uh, I was telling them earlier when people used to characterize me as a coach, one of my flaws would have been that I burned out my staff at times. And so, um, you know, since March, we've had to recreate education on a dime while we're floating the boat off the ship. Penny's staff worked extremely, extremely hard at getting a, um, a three-week plan out. Then a week later, we're told we need, actually need a continuity of learning plan, and it had to be approved and designed. And by the way, we rolled out one of the best ones in the state of Michigan. Um, and, and then on top of that, um, we begin to hear what COVID has done to state budgets, and we've gone to work and put together a lot of scenarios and plans and try to make this as painless and as panic-free as you can with the largest historical cut in the state of Michigan. Our state is basically bankrupt. They cannot make their payroll. They cannot pay, pay what, they're, what they're obligated to. This school year, when Brian talks about a possible uh, cut right now, that's because they simply can't pay their bills. And so um, our, it, we, it needs to be recognized that as well is going to be quite an event for us. Um, those are major, major topics that we're going to have to move go forward. On, on top of that, we know we need to re remediate kids and offer enrichment. And so we've tried to put together a summer enrichment plan with a lot of anxiety among staff. They're not really, really wanting to participate. Um, a lot of anxiety with parents who don't want to participate. And as you saw a little bit today, and you'll see tomorrow morning, um, a very good plan about summer learning rolling out as well. And by the way, we're trying to reinvent school maybe forever in the future. So next fall, we, we don't really know what that means. We're waiting for the governor's task force to give us some direction, but we've already been to work for months trying to figure out what the fall will look like. We've purchased safety materials. Um, we've been very busy trying to get ahead of that game as well. The learning management system that we purchased and the training staff right now is to make us flexible and the ability to, to give blended and online instruction next year if needed. And meanwhile, our FFO and our facilities folks are busy putting installing shields, temperature sensors, purchasing as many materials that have become available during this time period. Um, and then along we have a, a crisis in our community, um, really a man-made crisis of dam failures. Um, when I hear people describe it as a flood, I, I, I tell my colleagues from downstate that's a poor description. I think it was more of a typhoon or a hurricane that destroyed our community, part of our community. I, and certainly I, I feel from Meridian and Sanford, which was hit much harder than us. But um, on top of that, we've got that portion going on, which makes social-emotional learning extremely high. We already said we had kids with high anxiety and at risk and children of trauma that we've been dealing with the last couple of years. Can you only imagine the trauma and anxiety that's going to return to school next fall after the longest layoff of schooling in our history? Six months of no schooling and what that's going to mean. And then, um, on top of that, we had a tragedy last week um, on our work site. It was like the breaking straw for some of us as we dealt with that and, and fell for that family as we go forward and what they've um, gone through through all of that. We, we do know that um, it, was, it was a human error. We, um, all safety protocols were cleared. My OSHA has been in. It's cleared the site. They could technically return to work, but um, we've asked con the construction company involved to take a couple weeks, mourn their loss, and then return when they're able to return to the East Lawn site to finish it. Um, so from there, um, that's about as much information I can share for that family going forward. 
And so there's a lot going on, guys. And so we have the incident with the George Floyd uh, piece put into that. Um, and so we have got a lot of pieces that we're going to have to deal with going forward. And so um, at this time, we need to pull together, not apart, and we need to move forward and get that done, um, that work done. And there's just a lot of anxiety, and that pulling together is going to be a key piece. It's going to be a key piece because I'm not really seeing it in our society out there right now. So the last thing I'll bring to you tonight, um, we've talked a little bit about the performance contracting multiple times at the FFO level, a little bit at the board level. We had a presentation on that. Um, we talked with our uh, financial consultant, PFM, as Brian mentioned earlier. Um, he's looked at the numbers, uh, thinks it's very doable for us, the numbers that were um, broadly presented by the performance contractor that we've been working with looks reasonable. We talked today to our true and consultant um, who handles um, those pieces of it and um, if we're willing to kind of move forward we'll have uh, true and put together an RFP. We do have to bid it even though you it's similar to uh, a bond project in that you um, are working with someone but they're not guaranteed the work. They take a little risk in doing all the upfront work and, he, and they'll have to now do the full design while we're doing the RFP, and then we'll have a choice to who, who we choose from there. Um, but we'd like to move forward because still healthy financial um, situation overall for us, um, but at the same time, I don't think we're in a position to pull a few million dollars out to um, get that HVAC equipment. And the LED off-light is a bonus, so we get the LED lighting, some energy savings to hopefully pay for that over time. I don't think it'll ever quite break even, but it's an opportunity to get that equipment that we need. This end-of-life equipment at, at the administration center is going to quit soon. And as you know, State Street cannot come down until we move that equipment over. So um, we, we did all our legwork. Um, if that was the case, bidding would occur sometimes this summer, uh, selecting someone by fall. Um, if that was approved, then we would do the lighting on the B shift throughout the school year that was non intrusive. And then early spring, when the weather's mild enough in Michigan and not too hot, then you would pull the HVAC equipment off out of State Street. Um, and the administration center would have no cooling or heating for a short period of time, and we'd have that up and done. So we'll probably be bringing that forward to you. It's still, you know, it comes to you eventually to for the board for a full resolution, resolution vote, so you still have opportunity there. But so far, um, in all my discussions with you, I haven't seen any reason not to at least continue to pursue that. So any questions on that performance contact? We've kind of reviewed it. I'm sorry. I heard you, Mike. I, was there someone else talking? Or are we good? I don't see anyone, so. Okay. And that's all I have for you. Um, so I, I have one, one final thing to say, Mike, and, and, and you kind of alluded to it a little bit in your, in your closing remarks. Um, you know, you guys are, are running yourselves ragged and doing just an absolutely amazing job, and I cannot tell you how proud we are of you and the administrative team and the job that you guys have, are doing. Uh, and I know you're, you're too humble to, to mention it, but uh, you did a hell of a job. Uh, you and Penny and Brian and a number of other community members setting up that shelter at Midland High. Um, that was just a remarkable thing to see. I spent a few days there along with Phil and I know Lynn spent a lot of time there and man, Talk about making us proud. That was really, really something. And it was just a pure organic effort put together by you and by Brian and by Penny and just reaching out to our community and having everybody come together. It was just, man, it was just something to see. And, and the community, the community just embraced it and they loved it and they needed it. And those seniors, boy, they were, they were we really made them feel special uh, to, to the best we were able to do that. We made them comfortable until they were able to get housing, and that our, means the world. Our community today. definitely needs some wins right now, so <laughs> we need to move forward. Yeah, so job well done, Mike. Job well done. Phil, any comments? You were there. Lynn, anything? Uh, it was ama amazing to see, you know, I, and and just it it tells tells the community how much the public schools are the fabric of our community. And and our public school district makes makes our community whole. 
I would agree with that. And uh, it, you know, what was interesting to me was our community was amazing. I, words can't even describe that, but there were people that were driving from other communities to reach out and help and um, children and seniors and all kinds of people coming to see what they could do, what they could contribute. And the neat thing is it's, Mid, they're not in Midland High anymore, but it's ongoing, and it continues to be ongoing. So, again, I would thank everyone that was a part of that as well. Yeah, and, and the amount of students that came rushing to help, you know, mm -hmm. just really drives it home that, that we're doing something right, that, that they would do that. Exactly. So, uh, well done, guys. And that, that's all I've got. Unless anyone else has anything, we're going to – I'll take a motion to adjourn. Don't move. So, okay. Motion by Phil. Uh, support. Support by Mary. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, guys. It was great seeing you.